We are back, and you're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. Consortium News has a piece entitled From Forever to Eternal War. As it happens, the war on terror is anything but ended, even if it's been overshadowed by the war in Ukraine and simmering conflicts around the globe, all too often involving the United States. In fact, it now seems as if this country is moving at breakneck speed out of the era of forever war and into what might be thought of as the era of eternal war. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of American Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. You know, granted, it is uh, it's hard to even keep track of this is continuing in the piece. Granted, it's hard even to keep track of the potential powder kegs that seem all too ready to explode across the globe and are likely to involve the U.S. military in some fashion. Still, at this moment, perhaps it's worth running through the most likely spots for future conflict. They start with Russia and China. And Dr. Horn, before we get to that, uh, two points. One is, my son is 21 years old and has never known peace in the United States slash the world in his entire lifetime. And the second thing is, as we look at the escalation of violence in this country, we look at what happened at the bank with, and we look at what happened in Tennessee with the school— there's got to be a direct correlation between the increase in American domestic violence and the violence that the United States government is perpetuating around the world. Dr. Gerald Horn. Well, clearly that's the case. Uh, sadly, tragically, and unfortunately, too many forget that the way this continent was, quote, settled, unquote, was by debt of about three to four hundred years of war against the indigenous, uh, roughly from 1565 when the Spanish landed in what they call Florida up until about 1900 when you had the virtual, underlined virtual, cessation of wars against the indigenous because they were largely uh, defeated. And then there were the wars that the United States helped to ignite in Africa in order to get one ethnic group to fight against another so that the loser could be sold into slavery. And that helps to create a culture amongst the settler population, which is prone towards gunplay. Uh, you mentioned the shootings in Louisville, the shootings in Uvalde, the shootings that are all too frequent on the landscape. And we all know that the right wing tells us explicitly that they're in favor of the proliferation of weapons in case a government comes to power that they would have to remove by force of arms. And so obviously there is a dialectical connection between the culture of settler colonialism in North America and the proliferation of wars abroad. And sadly and tragically, the repeated setbacks or catastrophes that this culture helps to create, uh, be it the disaster in Libya, uh, be it the disaster in Afghanistan, uh, e ending with this ignominious evacuation by U.S. troops in August 2021, nothing seems to slow down this perpetual motion machine that led to the former U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower in leaving office in 60, 1960-61 a warning ominously about the creation of a military industrial complex. But I'm afraid that that was too little too late by Mr. Eisenhower. And let me also point you to the recent article on his substack by Seymour Hirsch, uh, understandably getting publicity <laughs> was the notion that Mr. Zelensky and his comrades are skimming uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from various scams, including uh, selling uh, Russian energy, believe it or not, but also by uh, selling weapons, these billions of dollars of weapons 
that the United States is sending over there. But perhaps the most dispiriting aspect of that story from the U.S. viewpoint was this depiction of Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state, who are seen by U.S. intelligence as being in way over their heads, as being the captains of the gang that cannot shoot straight. And these are the people who have the ear of the doddering, uh, perhaps dementia-minded U.S. president, Mr. Biden, who will be 86 years old or older, assuming that he wins, runs and wins in 2024. So this is a very dispiriting picture that I'm painting, but the tragedy is, is that I'm probably being too mild. You know, the other thing that's interesting about this is that <clears throat> you think of George Bush coming in saying compassionate conservatism. You think of Obama coming in. He's the anti-Iraq war guy. Oh, he starts war after war. You think of Joe Biden. Now he comes in and says, this is it for the for- forever wars. And yet you just rename them. And it's so that the leaders coming in know what the people want to hear. Oh, I'm the guy that's going to stop all of that stuff. And then as soon as they get in office, it's more of the same. And uh, uh, let me add add this to that, uh, the other story. Taiwan pushed closer to conflict by Washington. So all of that, and Joe Biden comes in, and now he's trying to turn uh, Taiwan into Ukraine 2.0. Dr. Horn. Well, once again, to reiterate, there are these underlying forces that are visible on the surface, speaking of the military industrial complex, speaking of Raytheon, which helped to produce the present secretary of war, speaking of Lord Austin, that wield an inordinate muscle on the political scene and help to generate these conflicts so that they can profit. And as well, uh, speaking of Taiwan, uh, as you probably likely know, uh, as we speak, there are these major military maneuvers uh, unfolding between the United States and the Philippine army and military, uh, obviously targeting the People's Republic of China. At the same time, China is flexing its muscles with regard to the rebel province that is Taiwan. Clearly, and it doesn't take an oracle, to figure this one out, the United States is gravely concerned about the fact that China is in the passing lane, that as President Nixon suggested before he passed away, by executing the anti-Soviet Entente with China uh, some decades ago, he basically created, in Mr. Nixon's word, a Frankenstein, I think he meant a Frankenstein monster, uh, harking back to the tale of the mad scientist who in his laboratory helps to create a force that ultimately helps to uh, destroy the mad scientist. And so on top of that, you have the impending failure of so many banks in this country, uh, starting with Silicon Valley Bank in Northern California, then ricocheting across the Atlantic to Credit Suisse in Switzerland. And just as in Switzerland, the the treatise of Credit Suisse, uh, to use a euphemism, has been gobbled up by one of its competitors. But now the headline out of Switzerland is that this gargantuan bank that's been created is not necessarily too big to fail. It's too big to bail out. That is to say, the bank in some ways is dwarfing the country. And that's the direction in which the United States is heading. That is to say, where the banks, starting with J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America, are so huge that if they stumble, the Federal Reserve might not be able to rescue them, which would make the Great Depression of the 1930s seem like a Sunday school picnic by way of comparison. And of course, that too creates the seeds for war and conflict as the United States seeks to rescue itself from the morass that it has created by basically hitting another country in the head and taking its stuff. U.S. Hawk touts grand strategy to counter Russia and China. John Bolton has floated a plan involving increased arms spending, nuclear tests, and a global NATO to defend Taiwan. Former National Security Advisor, he has urged Washington to implement a new Cold War style against China in order to as he says, protect Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Horn, I don't know what part of uh, Occam's razor 
Bolton doesn't know or doesn't understand, but I understand that, you know, the 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 adage is the the simplest strategy or solution is usually the best strategy or solution. And to me, it seems if you want to tamp down the conflict regarding Taiwan, United States, just see, just adhere to your own one China policy and stop poking China in the eye. Dr. Gerald Horn. Well, as you know, more than most, there is much more at stake. Uh, that is to say, it's not only China being in the passing lane, it's not only de-dollarization, that is to say, the impending replacement of the dollar as the currency of choice globally, which would be a wounding blow to U.S. imperialism. It's also the ability to engage in shakedowns of smaller countries or intimidation of smaller countries, uh, starting with Iraq in 2003 as Exhibit A. But Mr. Bolton also is motivated by the fact that many fellow imperialists seem like they're willing to jump ship. That is to say, the U.S. imperialist ships, speaking of Mr. Macron, the president of France, and his trip to China, uh, Olaf Scholz, the chancellor in Berlin, and his recent trip to China, both with plane loads of business people in tow, And it'll be interesting to see how Madame Bierbach, the hawkish anti-China German foreign minister, is greeted in Beijing. She's on her way now, on her way there now, if not there already. And it'll be interesting to see if she comes with an olive branch or she comes with tough words. I dare say it'll probably be the former, even though as a representative of the Green Party, uh, she's supposed to, I had thought, uh, represent a kind of dovish sensibility. But... We also have this crisis impending in the United States of America because Mr. Bolton in that op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that you're citing also suggested that in order to finance this Asian, Euro-Asian NATO or this worldwide NATO, that is to say going beyond the anti-Moscow psychosis to trying to uh, circle the entire planet, uh, he, he dropped, he let slide, let slip the idea that this would cause a massive cut in social programs. You already have GOP (laughs) candidates for president talking about eliminating the Department of Education, which I guess if you want to make for a more pliant constituency, you eliminate education, but eliminating food stamps, cutting back on Social Security. And of course, we'll be facing a crisis within weeks because of the debt ceiling debate, whereas the GOP in the House is threatening to hold the nation hostage unless it agrees to these massive cuts. And so if that does not awaken a good deal of the U.S. population from its typical slumber, I'm not sure what will. Well, let's give it a shot. One more thing that may. Uh, there are a number of Republicans are now talking about invading Mexico <laughs> in the name of the drug war. Uh, we got about two and a half minutes, Dr. Horn. Well, and the name of the drug war is a cover. You, you know that I'm speaking to you from Texas. And it's no secret that the Texas oil men for decades have had their eyes on Mexican energy, Mexican oil. This idea of invading Mexico because of drugs is just the cover for invading Mexico in order to take its oil. And, of course, Texas used to be part of Mexico until in the 19th century. The settlers decided to secede not least because they wanted to continue slavery, which Mexico had abolished in the late 1820s under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero. And then the United States and Texas waged war on Mexico again in the 1840s and walked away with California, which by some measures is the fifth largest economy on planet Earth as we speak. So it's not surprising that Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina and his fellow pirates and ingrates and thieves would like to repeat history, but I dare say that given Mexico's growing relationship with the People's Republic of China, its growing relationship with Russia, its reluctance to join the sanctions crusade against Moscow, that Mexico will have more allies in the 21st century than it did in the 19th century when it was successfully denuded of assets. And Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. Folks, you're listening.